And, and in terms of value that you are adding, uh, as far as you know, uh, creating a Nori token, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what is the intrinsic value that you can think of? You know, you know, in the context of Nori. Yeah. Well. Okay. Why don't I explain the history of carbon offsetting and how this has worked? Because um, it's not something that um, even people working in the space understand all that well. Mm-hmm. So going back to the late 1990s, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted at the UN level. Basically, every major country except for the U.S. Uh, committed to uh, reducing their their national carbon footprints by purchasing carbon credits from developing countries. And the the idea here was this should be an equitable wealth transfer. Like we're we're a developed country because we've burned all these fossil fuels and used all this energy to get to this point, and we live these nice lifestyles. And who are we to go say to developing parts of the world like, okay, there's a climate problem now, so you don't get to burn all the energy? Like that that's radically unfair. So the the notion was these developed countries would pay the developing countries for carbon reductions happening inside their borders. But then that changed in 2015 when the Paris Accords were adopted. And so now every single country has their own emissions reductions targets. The way this played out in the early 2000s was uh, a bunch of different um, private organizations uh, respond. So there are carbon offset registries. These are um, basically maintainers of databases of serial numbers representing the carbon credits that are, that are created. And these registries develop uh, what they call protocols. And a protocol just lists out the rules for how you're going to measure and verify. And we do something very similar at Nori. We call them methodologies, but it's basically the same. And these registries are nonprofits and they charge all of their reven- their fees, uh, which is the revenue, on the supply side. So they charge registration fees, listing fees, transaction fees, consulting fees to help develop uh, protocols for specific projects. And that means that uh, project developers can end up spending somewhere between 30 to $100,000 just on the carbon credit certification process, not including their actual like capital expenses and the operating expenses from doing the project itself. So it's, it's a very high barrier to entry on the supply side. And then uh, what happens is they'll get issued carbon credits and then most of the time they'll sell them to brokers uh, because there is no, it's funny, we use the term carbon market, but there is no such thing as a carbon market. Uh, You, uh, this is not like an open and transparent thing that people can go to. And there's certainly not like liquid uh, trading going on in a way where we can see it as an actual price. So they work with brokers who then try to find them buyers. And oftentimes those brokers might sell to some other broker. And so these carbon credits are going to trade like multiple times over. And there's a con concept in carbon offsetting of retirement, which means uh, you're, you're saying, I'm the end buyer of this carbon credit. I'm going to retire it and make, make it so that it can never be sold again. And I'm going to take final credit for it. Okay, great. But actually very few carbon credits actually end up getting retired. And most of the time they're just being pushed around uh, by different financial traders. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. If we're going to be really serious about climate change, we should be designing our system so that every new dollar spent on carbon results in net new carbon coming out of the air. Um, if the, that second sale, the third sale, the fourth sale, that money doesn't end up in the hands of the original project developer. It's just going to a financial middleman, which just drives up transaction costs and reduces the amount of scale of carbon projects that, were, that are happening here. So I view that as a double counting problem. It also exposes different vectors for fraud. Um, where uh, you can have co- like say a big oil and gas company buys up a lot of carbon credits and then they make a big announcement saying they're being uh, you know, better for the planet or whatever but then those carbon credits sit as an asset on their balance sheet and if they want they could then sell them and potentially even had a profit and then at that point is their environmental claim like actually valid did they actually offset that carbon i would argue no because they've relinquished ownership of those carbon credits uh the other problem is when it comes to international accounting literally every single credit that has ever been sold across international borders has been counted more than once so if a project happens in brazil and then it gets exported to a buyer in France, both Brazil and France are going to count that as an emissions reduction relative to their Paris goals. Brazil says, hey, this project happened inside of our borders, so it's our emission reduction. But then France says, well, we imported that carbon credit, so we get to take credit for it. It's a really stupid problem. 
it's easily solved with double entry bookkeeping, but they don't do it. And this is actually, uh, so uh, we're recording this just before the uh, COP26, the next uh, conference of the parties uh, conference that happens at the UN level. This has been the major sticking point ever since Paris, which is how do you deal with this double counting problem? And it's more or less Brazil that keeps blocking it for political reasons. Um, So with these double counting issues, uh, then there's also, I should mention fraud too. So in the late 2000s, there was a um, a project called the Chicago Climate Exchange in the US. And this was a carbon market specifically for regenerative agriculture. So very similar to what Nori is doing today. And you would have cases where uh, related entities could trade carbon credits off book with each other. And so say you sell me 100,000 carbon credits and we agree in the contract that it's going to be at $1 per ton. But on our books, we're going to mark it to market, uh, meaning at the market price. So say the market trading price is $14. So we're going to report it as if it was a $14 per ton transaction, but we actually only transacted on $1 per ton. Mm -hmm. And if you are a speculative trader or someone else doing analysis on the market, or you're all, you're participating in the market by buying or selling, and you see the report that it was trading at $14, well, then you think, okay, there's, there's trading volume, there's demand for this product at $14, but it's a lie. Mm -hmm. And that was what ultimately collapsed that market. And that happens because they're able to trade the carbon credits over and over again. So knowing these issues, double counting and fraud and so on, at Nori, we're doing something very different and unique from every other player in this space. What we do is we enforce immediate retirement. So when a buyer purchases the NRT, the Nori removal ton, it goes in, it's actually an NFT, a non-fungible token that gets recorded on the blockchain and it goes into their wallet and it's made non-transferable. So they can never resell it. And in exchange, they'll pay one Nori token, uh, mm-hmm. the Nori, um, always can purchase one ton. The price, it will fluctuate based on supply and demand, but it still always purchases one ton. So think of it like a gift card for a ton of CO2 by separating out these two assets. We immediately solve the double counting problem because the carbon cannot be retraded. We ensure that every time someone buys an NRT by buying the carbon, they're actually paying the person who did the carbon removal work. And we also create uh, a, create a tradable commodity asset that we can use as a reference price. And so that people can speculate on that. So uh, as commodities traders do, and uh, it can help bring in more capital, help with business forecasting and ultimately help with price discovery. Um, so this two asset, two token model is what's unique about us and what we're trying to um, change up the way that uh, carbon finance works. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I like the I like the fact that you you uh, you explain me the the <laughs> the background. You know, otherwise I would be mm-hmm. like only asking about why why Nori token now. You know, there are already so many tokens out there. <laughs> right, and th- there are a lot of tokenized uh, carbon projects out there, but all that they're doing is tokenizing existing carbon credits that have come through these registries, which have all, I mean, they still have those huge barriers to entry for the supply side, and they're still just trading the same ton of CO2 over and over again. So um, unfortunately, I think there are a lot of attempts at like crypto carbon tokens that are really just perpetuating this old system and aren't like they're acting as if this is a demand side problem, but that's, that's not the case. This is not a demand side problem. It's a supply side and double counting problem. Mm-hmm, 